G'day, you mob. Welcome to this episode of the Aussie English Podcast. Today, I have Dr. John Martin. He is a terrestrial ecologist at the Taronga Institute of Science and Learning, and you are interested in the ecology of wildlife in human-dominated landscapes. Before I let you say g'day, how's it going? I saw you in the news, obviously, recently, and, and I had to get you on the podcast talking about cockatoos, but your recent paper, Innovation and Geographic Spread of a Complex Foraging Culture in an Urban Parrot, got published in Science, which is the pinnacle of, of publications, effectively, right, next to nature. So, so um, yeah, John Martin, welcome to the podcast, and congrats. That's, that's huge, mate. Well done. G'day, Pete. Thanks for that uh, pumping up my tyres. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it certainly was... Um, a nice achievement for for the team, and yeah, uh, everyone loves a good cockatoo story. So do you get to retire now? You just tap out. There's no, there's no doing that twice, right? Lightning doesn't strike twice, at least not easily. <laughs> um, I'm certainly not retiring, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, look, if if it happens again in uh, my career, that'll be pretty nice. But um, you know, a couple of my colleagues who are co-authors on on that paper, they're they're uh, high flyers, and yep. um, they publish in nature and science now here and there. So um, it's good to work with um, some really, really smart and talented people. That's the power of networking, right? Uh, sometimes it's a bit just like lightning striking, you know, you get a bit lucky, but uh, otherwise, yes, networking is important. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to get you on to talk about this paper. But before that, can you tell me a bit about where you grew up in Australia and, and how you ended up wanting to become a, a terrestrial ecologist? As that doesn't tend to be the thing that most primary school students, you know, put their hand up and say, this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah, so I grew up in Sydney, so southern Sydney, the St George area, uh, and we would go on family holidays up in the National Park, just, you know, sort of an hour's drive north of Sydney. And I just always loved being in the water and on the water and fishing and, you know, you go bushwalking. And so I ultimately wanted to be a National Park Ranger. and spend my days in the trees. Um, did you did you have a crush on Ranger Stacy as well from Totally Wild? <laughs> oh, look, I am a big fan of Ranger Stacy. I don't think I had a big crush on her, but um, I was pretty excited when I was on Totally Wild about 20 years ago as a, you know, in a scientific capacity. Uh, that, you know, that sort of met that childhood dream. Of, cheeky, uh, <laughs> cheeky flex, cheeky flex. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll try not to name drop too many times as we chat. No, hey, um, go to town. I love it. I'll probably know them too. <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, look, I just grew up in suburban Sydney. And, um, and yeah, it's, you know, as a kid, lots of us uh, have that interest in things like marine biology. And, you, you still, especially if you like the water and you think, oh, yeah, you watch some docos on the Great Barrier Reef. God, how good would it be to be paid to go snorkeling and scuba diving every day? Um, so I failed and, and I don't do that, but um, <laughs> I, I do research on birds and mammals and uh, I do get to spend a bit of time in the trees. So what caught your eye there in terms of terrestrial vertebrates, uh, you know, things like lizards and, and birds and everything? Was there a point where you were wanting to be a marine biologist and then there was just some burning question that took you away and you end up going down that path, that rabbit hole? Yeah, so there were two books that I read in probably the late 90s, um, and one was Feral Future and the other was Future Eaters. Yep. And so Feral Future by Tim Lowe is all about the impact on our native species in Australia by invasive species, so the European red fox, the cane toad, European rabbits, and, of course, all the weeds. Um, and so I, just, I got really interested in that ecological uh, framework of thinking about invasion ecology and how we could be helping to conserve our native plants and animals ecosystems. Um, and then I sort of missed that ticket as well, uh, <laughs> as, as happens. I mean, it's great working at Taronga Conservation Society now because we do, we have a number of breed for release programs for threatened species. So reintroducing them back into the wild. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more involved in, in some of those projects That's, that aligns with uh, aspects of the, the removal of pest species and the, the restoration of, of ecological functioning communities. Um, Why does Australia get it so bad? Because we've been in the news quite a bit recently, haven't we, with a lot of the Brumby stuff, you know, down, down south here. Um, there tends to be always stories about feral cats and, and cane toads and goats and, and pigs and everything and the amount of damage they're doing to to the um, you know 
natural environment here. Is Australia really that unique compared to other countries like the US and everything? Or do we just have a, a bad reputation because we have all the cute and cuddly animals? <laughs> Uh, look, we're highly vulnerable is actually the answer, I would say. Um, so, you know, we were we were pretty much a little um, time-locked uh, little bastion of, of biodiversity uh, that really didn't have the same pressures and threats in the, in the systems uh, that have been introduced. And so, um, you know, you just look at rabbits, for example, they are... Uh, far more fecund. So they breed and reproduce far more rapidly as the saying goes. Um, and, uh, and so they, um, they just were able to, to outcompete native species. Um, and similarly with things like foxes, whilst there was the dingo, there's some really interesting research that shows dingoes being you know, quite a bit larger than a fox, they ate often larger prey. And so those really small mammals that the dingoes didn't really bother with when the fox came along, suddenly we're just sitting ducks and got wiped out and, and got impacted twofold by rabbits competing with them for, for food to eat and also burrowing, but also the foxes eating them. So, and then you add cats to that mix as well. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, look, there's, there's this high susceptibility um, with the plants. It's a similar story there. Uh, just that, you know, there's some great research done on the um, enemy release hypothesis, which is something that Darwin came up with, you know, many moons ago and, and the whole thing that, so those animals, but also those plants, they've been introduced into this landscape. They haven't evolved in this landscape and their natural predators or natural pathogens, so diseases and whatnot, are far less common or, or non-existent here. And so hence, you, you throw out the blackberry seeds when you're walking across the landscape and what happens <laughs> they grow big and bold and strong and and they've got lots of fruit and the birds eat them and spread them and then they grow and grow and grow so what was the name of the guy who did that because i remember hearing a story about him saying everyone in the future is going to thank me um, for all the hikers in the future will thank me that they'll have this nice food and you're like mate it, the fruit ripens for like a few weeks a year yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i can't remember who it was but you know you, you no doubt across the um, acclimatization societies, which were uh, ye olde English types who like to uh, recreate the English landscape over here. And, you know, we still actually have a fundamental problem with that. Uh, we have a lot of people who don't like to necessarily have native gardens and, and want to grow uh, plants from all over the place. And, and we're still importing plants that are going to become weeds in the future. And that is just insanity. That always blew my mind, you know, that we see the amount of border control. I remember I think there was an ad with Steve Irwin back in the day where he was holding up a tiny little wood mite or something like that and being like, you know, we need to protect our borders from these animals. And yet we don't seem to have the same kind of restrictions at all for foreign plants. Look, so there is a process. You can't just bring anything in. Um, it's obviously very difficult. Uh, people can bring seeds in in their luggage, and I guess that's you know, an unfair advantage with them. You, <laughs> yeah, an egg so, is one thing, but a seed's another. Yeah, and so there is a um, an honor system. We're all in this together with respect to border security. Uh, the challenge there, of course, is um, some people they they might be bringing them in accidentally, or you know they don't care. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, that, yeah, it's it blows my mind as well because. Uh, it's hugely challenging and it's hugely costly. Uh, so it's costly on many fronts. You know, obviously from my perspective, we're talking about biodiversity. So we actually have threatened species that are uh, potentially going to go extinct and we've got other species that have gone extinct because of these non-native species. Um, but, but equally, there is a cost to things like agriculture. And, yeah. you know, when you, when you look at some of those economic costs for whether it's growing vegetables or, or crops, so grains, or whether it's, you know, lambs being eaten, um, you know, once once things are, are in, they're bloody hard to get out. It, it blows my mind too, some of the, the situations you hear about in the news. I think there was a guy who had like, so they found 150 dead uh, wedge-tailed eagles in his fridge that he shot. And you're just like, the dude's a farmer and he doesn't realise those animals aren't actually, you know, harming really harming his his livestock they're potentially eating the ones that are already dead or maybe the odd lamb but if you get rid of all the wedgies you're gonna have way more problems with rabbits 
and you know other vermin that are going to affect your crops and and farming and everything it's just it blows my mind still that the average person doesn't seem to have a good grip of how important the sort of balance is in, in nature right especially if you're a farmer you yeah. you're spending your days on the land years you know you presumably a lot of farmers have, have grown up on the land as well so um Look, these are these are old mentalities, and so I do some research on flying foxes, and you know, you talk to yeah. to people in some areas, and they've all got you know, if they're of a certain age, so our parents' age perhaps, um, they've all got a story about going shooting flying foxes, <laughs> uh, and it was just something that you did. Um, and so, <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to laugh, but it's just sort of like it's it seems crazy to me that you would like come on guys grab your guns <laughs> yeah well look and and so even from a human wildlife conflict perspective which is something i i have an interest in, in um with respect to native animals but that also relates to the non-native animals uh you know that that literally was what they did in the 1800s back in the day if flying foxes came into town and you didn't want them in your town yeah you would call everyone up and uh you would all go and shoot a bunch of them and ideally they'd, they'd go away um, and, you know, one of the, the traditional uh, practices around a range of things, whether it's, it's crop protection or even some fishing practices uh, with things like cormorants, was you'd have someone stand there with a shotgun. Mm. And so, you know, they, they were, this is a very human response because yeah. we have that power and those animals, whether it was shooting a cockatoo or, or, some, or a flying fox, isn't of consequence to that human being. but protecting their grain crop or having a good night's sleep is. And yeah, so, I mean, obviously we're changing our understanding uh, and a lot of people have a greater appreciation for nature. Uh, and, you know, that's that's really valuable that, that we we do sort of uh, value what we, we see in our day-to-day -day lives. The thing that's challenging is how do you value the things that you don't see? And that's yeah. that's where climate change is is a big issue, and and you know just the idea that uh, forests are being cut down, you know, throughout Southeast Asia or throughout uh, South America, and these are significant issues that we don't necessarily see, and so it's hard to to take action. And anyway, it's it's easy to be saying some of those things here because we already cut down a, a lot of the forests, so you know it's. <laughs> We, we have a fraught world and a fraught situation um, when it comes to trying to get the balance right. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember, I think I've told this story a few times on the podcast, but I did some field work in um, Sulawesi in Indonesia. and Half your luck. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. But I remember being there and just being like blown away at the amount of deforestation and um, that a lot of the Indonesians who were farmers there just did not give a shit about littering about the, the natural wildlife and i mean once you go there you understand it's like dude they're trying to survive they're trying to get enough food to have on the table that, that their worries aren't whether or not they can throw batteries into the river like there used to be a guy who would just be like gone it's gone you just throw it in the river and it's just gone and i'm like mate your town's downstream yeah you can't You're like that <laughs> <laughs> exactly but yeah it just blew my mind and then you you realize oh we've gone through that We've done that. We don't have these areas quite a lot of the time because we already blew through them and there's zero there. So who am I to judge these countries where they're like, well, this is our resource to do with as we please and hopefully get to your level. But yeah, it is such a difficult thing, right? And I'm sure you've gone for a bushwalk and you've stumbled across a car surrounded by big trees and you're like, how the hell did that get there? And, you know, <laughs> it, it's a clear indication. Those trees aren't that old. Yeah. You know, this area was clear enough that you could drive a car into it, whether it was only 50 or, or, you know, 80 years ago. But, you know, cars aren't that common that they that it's going to be a much older than sort of 80 years. So, but, you, you know, you certainly find rubbish and stuff as well, whether it's tin cans and, and all sorts of things. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that we all sort of need to learn a little bit about. And look, I'll just mention a project I'm involved with, which is called the Urban Field Naturalist Project. And it's all about connecting with nature and sharing your stories. And so the, the, the premise is in our everyday lives, we all have those moments if we're actually observing the world around us. You know, you might be gardening, you, you might have just gone for a walk um, in your lunch break, 
it, it could be anything. You know, you might have just seen a, a, an amazing leopard slug and you're like, what <laughs> the hell is that? Um, or you got swooped by a magpie. You know, um, I, I swim regularly in the ocean and yeah, two days ago I was swimming along and there were just two Port Jackson sharks swimming along below me. And I was just, you know, really enjoying looking at them as I was cruising along. And, and that, anyway, so the whole thing is, you know, you put yourself in the story because we're a part of nature. And Does that blow your mind? Sorry to interrupt you, but, but for so long, it seems like humans have been trying to tame the wild, tame nature and get control of it and almost obliterate it, right? Keep it away. It's, it's, it's dangerous. There are diseases. There are animals that are going to kill you. Getting biblical here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then at the same time, we're, we're drawn to it. You know, like you look at the average Australian and it's almost like, sorry for, sorry for the average Australian, but the more bogan you are, the more you probably like camping and getting into nature. And, you know, like there seems to be that kind of stereotype. So it seems like it's spread across all of society where we still want a nice garden. We want to see animals. We want to go into nature. We want it there, but we kind of want that control of it. Do you think it's getting better though? Are we getting, now we're getting over that sort of hump of, of doing a lot of damage and, and reversing that, or do you think it's, it's just going to get worse? Uh, look, I, I'd say it's certainly, there's a big movement in urban Australia and there's a parallel movement in the farming world about the, the importance of uh, saving your soils and having water in, in the system. And, and so the, the challenge is um, we're still learning about this country. You know, we're yeah. still learning about uh, whether it's fire or flood or drought, uh, you know, and these things are changing. This is these things are dynamic and there are global pressures that are changing them as well. So now it's like, oh, well, what, what we sort of thought was happening uh, has changed. Uh, and, you know, things like heat stress events are becoming far more common. And that has an impact on, on whether it's plants and animals. It also has an impact on us, of course. Mm. Um, so, look, I, I guess I'm an optimist and you sort of have to be. Uh, otherwise, you know, gonna have a pretty shit day um <laughs> or life right it's yeah. been negative all the time <laughs> so um so yeah and look you know it's it's interesting you, whether it's it's just talking to your mates and you know they're like oh you know i watched gardening australia that day and you're like really you watched gardening australia i'm really surprised <laughs> by that and you're like you know it's like, god you really have settled down haven't you um and so that there, there are some there are lots and lots of things out there i think that are that are positive um there's, I guess, a lot of it's pretty, uh, pretty surface deep, though. You know, it's pretty shallow. And 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 as a really simple example of that is, lots of people don't know the names of the plants or the animals, um, yeah. especially you know, the plants. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's a tree. And, yeah, <laughs> people are pretty good on their garden plants if they're interested in that. But you know, beyond that, it's it's you know, oh yeah. That's a gum and that's an acacia yeah. or that's a wattle, let's say. Um, anyway. and Which would uh, be like going out there and being like, oh, look, it's a mammal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I oh, saw a bunch of fish when I was swimming, <laughs> you know. Like, Damn, oh, yeah. this guy's a biologist or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, you know, th that comes down to individuals and, and the time that you put into those things um, and also, you know, your upbringing. But. But I think that, you know, the positive things is who doesn't enjoy th that weekend away, whether it is an Airbnb on a farm or in a, in a country town or you, it is camping, um, you know, people, I guess it, to me, that's that whole thing. Everyone's got a story because that's actually what people do is they go for a walk outside. You know, they don't go, oh, I'm going to go like, well, I guess some people go to the, the shopping centre, but a lot of other people <laughs> are going to go, Oh, I went to the wine region and we did this really nice tour. And, you know, in the morning we, we went for um, a bike ride through the, through the state forest or we went through a bushwalk. And that's literally what most people do when they go on holiday is try and get into nature and, and try and do that in their, in their lives um, to some degree. So I think all those things are positive. I think a lot of it is actually really passive. You know, people haven't gone, I'm going on this epic adventure. Uh, they might just think of it as I'm going to the Hunter Valley and I'm going to drink some wine, but you're actually getting out into nature. And what are you doing? Oh, look at that. There's some kangaroos in the paddock. That's cool. <laughs> you know, and, and that's that's something you're, you're appreciating, the fact that you're not in the city anymore. It would be really interesting to do a study on 
on people, two populations, one that does get back to nature regularly and then the other that doesn't and is always in the city, you know, 24-7 and to have a look at their cortisol levels, you know, to see are they getting, are they more stressed out, are they more relaxed? Because there does seem to be that sort of thing where it's almost like you're, you know, I remember being surfing as well once and seeing dolphins out there and it was like sunset and I was like, I felt like I was stoned or something, you know, it just felt like such a sort of spiritual event um, that you couldn't, you wouldn't have like, oh, there I was sitting at the train station and this train came past and I was like, man, I'm up there. <laughs> and each to their own, but uh, yeah, I'm in the dolphin camp. Um, yeah, <laughs> Not seeing a train the graffiti spotter. on the train as it goes by uh, isn't the thing that's that's you know making my day. But um, <laughs> you know, uh, as I say, it, it, it's it's each to their own, and that's that beautiful thing. I guess at the at the bare minimum, we all do get out into nature at some point, and whether or not we enjoy it as much as the person next to us, that's a different thing. Awesome, dude. Let's chat about your um your paper and the recent study that you you got published. But I looking into it, it looks like you've been doing it for quite a few years now, collecting um, data on cockatoos. And so, I'll let you you be the one to tell us the story. What what was your recent paper about? So hopefully the listeners are familiar with the sulphur crested cockatoo, which is uh, the screams, right? Oh my god! Yep, yeah. you do a good impersonation. Yeah. Uh, so. Funnily, a friend of mine from South Africa, when she moved over, she was an animal lover and she just was. arrived in... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> is, is, is an animal lover. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, she, uh, she, came, she just arrived in Sydney and she heard that. that <laughs> and um, she literally turned to someone and said, what's wrong with that bird? We've got to help it. Uh, yeah, and they're like, what are you talking about? So, um, yeah, that's what they sound like. They're, um, they're not known for their melodic song. Um, but, uh, but a quiet they, taste. Yeah, yeah. It's very uh, ochre, yeah. Like Vegemite, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, they, um, so they're common in a lot of urban areas. Uh, they've got that punk crest that they can raise up and down, and that's where they get their name, the uh, sulfur being yellow-coloured. Uh, otherwise, they're a big white bird and, you know, they're pretty much the size of your forearm or, you know, a little bit bigger depending on how tall you are. Um, and uh, and so they're a big unit. Uh, they fly in flocks um, and they're really social. And that's actually a really key component to this study was that we, uh, one of our colleagues who's a co-author on this, lived down in the Stanwell Park area and he had observed in, in his suburban area cockatoos opening the lid of the red household bins on bin day to go bin diving. Uh, <laughs> they'd throw the rubbish out of the bin to get to some food. And so it's it's an unfortunate thing because they are creating some pollution and, and obviously pissing off some people. But um, they, uh, they're, they're scavenging ultimately and getting a free feed. And, um, you know, there are two things there. Some people will go, well, why is there any food in those bins? You know, like shouldn't we be... Composting as we and, waste, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's it, to me. I was a bit like, yeah, I think that's a bit naive. Um, but um, yeah. So there's there's, it's a novel behaviour that hadn't been seen before. Um, and so at least in that, cockatoos, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's certainly a few people that do it. That's <laughs> no, um, I was thinking more of the um, what are they called? Bears the, and the bandicoots and yeah, ibis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not bandicoots, God, bad. Um, but um, <laughs> imagine a bandicoot. <laughs> Got any truffles? <laughs> yeah. So for anyone who's never seen a bandicoot, you can go Google that. Um, but, yeah, the um, – and look, there's a key difference there. A lot of people be familiar with the bin chicken, the Australian white ibis, and, and I do some research on them as well. And we've actually got a project called Big City Birds, and it's it's actually asking the community to report where they're seeing ibis and cockies and, and the different behaviours, like what they're eating and where they're nesting. To plug this quickly, it's an app. So if you guys are, you know – got your phone you can download the big city birds app and you can you know upload sightings and, and help them with data collection yeah and and this um this study was informed by the community's report so you know uh richard saw this this bin opening sort of let's say five years ago and in 2018 with uh, barbara and lucy we um we did a community survey and really critically we wanted to know where this bin opening behavior was happening but also where it was not happening and that's that's key and, and a lot of people you know when you when we tend to do these citizen science projects and ask the community for information 
It's very easy to get people, well, not, not very easy. People are more likely to report to you that they have seen something than they haven't seen something. You know, it's pretty hard to get someone to, to bother to do a survey to say, haven't seen it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But absence of this behaviour was really important for understanding uh, the geographic spread through time because we also had a question about how long have you been seeing this behaviour. And so this was down in southern Sydney in the Sutherland Shire. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Sutherland Shire, but there's been there's a few memes about blowing up the bridges and towing it out into the ocean and getting rid of the, the beautiful bogans in, in the Shire. It's a nice part of the world. It's right next to where I grew up in, in the St. George area. But anyway, it's an um, interesting crowd. Um, and uh, uh, and for a little bit further south in the Wollongong region, um, was was the uh, this behaviour was occurring, and so then people would tell us uh, when they w that they were seeing it, and also how long they've been seeing it. And so what we we could do there, and so just for the people listening, the birds land on the bin. Cockatoos have two toes forwards and two toes back, which allows them to grip. Uh, they've got a big beak, and so being the size that they are, I mentioned before, um, they prop the bin up. They have a, 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 like with their beak or with their foot, they look in to see how full the bin is because they don't want it to be a, a very empty bin. Because they, they get trapped be in the inside. The bin. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. And then they've got a few different techniques where they shuffle along the side of the bin whilst holding the lid in their mouth or in their foot and flipping it over so it's completely open and then they can get into it. So it's quite a challenging behaviour. And we actually saw that, uh, you know, People often put out their yellow bin or their green bin at the same time, but the cockies, they were quite, you know, they, they knew where the food was. So 90% of the time they were opening bins, they were opening the red bins. They're so beautifully labelled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we saw that uh, predominantly it was adult males that were able to do this and they're slightly larger. So the females are just slightly smaller, um, but juveniles and females could also do this behaviour. But this, the, the cool component to this was that it started in a, a really discrete area of a couple of suburbs and it spread to over 44 neighbouring suburbs and through, you know, a few years. Um, one of the things that we've learned through our wing tagging project of cockatoos, which you can report wing tags using the Big City Bird app, so we learn about individual birds. Pete's gone here, John's mm -hmm. gone there. Um, and we can learn about that through time, was that cockies don't move very far at all they're bloody lazy and uh and the the simple answer there is there's a lot of food in the landscape for them so they only really move within sort of a five kilometer radius sometimes they'll go you know 10 k's but a lot of the time they're only moving within a 5k radius and and you think about that that's your suburb you know like that's me walking to, to my local supermarket is a kilometer away they're living in isolation man this is yeah. covid lockdown <laughs> they've only got their five kilometer radius yeah yeah they're very much about the uh, the Victorian approach to COVID and the 5K radius lockdown. <laughs> they don't um, want to help spread it. <laughs> no. So, so what that meant was that you had birds in a very discrete area learning from each other, so social learning, and learning a specific behaviour of how to open the bins. And then those birds, when they disperse, so let's say it was a younger bird and it moved, say, 5, 10, well, let's say 10 or 20 k's away, it then taught some of the other birds in that community and they didn't know how to do it. So they then learn through social learning again. But what we've seen is that in those slightly distant areas, they have different behaviours of how to open the bin. So, yeah. you know, I always do it with my beak because <laughs> I'm from Sutherland. You always do it with your foot because you're from Stanwell Park and we know people from Stanwell Park uh, have a foot fetish. No. Um, so it's anyway, what that then showed was that there are different cultures. And that's um, a great analogy for that that I came up with telling a friend the other day was um, uh, was it it's a bit like if you grew up in in a you know Hawthorne, well then you go for Hawthorne. Yeah. Whereas if you grew up in Geelong, you go for Geelong. Um, the other analogy is in Sydney, we drink schooners. In Melbourne, you drink pints. And <laughs> that's a cultural difference in those different societies. It's really simple. We just have the culture here of every pub has, has schooners, whereas in Melbourne, every pub has pints. And, yeah. So 
have you thought about doing a a genetic study to this as well to work out if these populations are much more closely related than I guess you know populations that don't you know than than randomly expected because that that would sound like you would have individuals that are born in a certain area they see their parents doing it they disperse however far away and then they end up passing that on to the local cockatoos in that area so it'd be interesting to know are they actually much more closely related and there's a genetic component to it as well or is it just a spreading like as soon as they see it they're like boom locked in pass that on to the next generation in the next suburb yeah and so there's there's really cool points there and, and so first and foremost is um not all of them can do it so even if you disperse you might know of this behavior but if you can't do it i never got know, the muscles <laughs> yeah it's a bit like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and he ends up trapped on a planet that, and he's like, well, I come from this really advanced society that has cars and you know microwaves, but he doesn't know how to build any of those things. So he opens a sandwich shop because they have never eaten sandwiches before. You <laughs> just very, stick with what, what you're good with. Yeah, what you can do, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it, it's it's not spreading like wildfire in that sense because of the fact that it's it's a, quite a skilled behaviour. Um, but we are actually uh, doing a genetic study to look ah. at the relatedness of the birds, yeah. And so we've um, we've got some some preliminary results that show that the birds within a flock are um, are highly uh, related and um, more cl- well, more closely related than the the neighbouring flock. So there does seem to be a, a within flock um, aspect to to the the genetics it's interesting um seeing even like three generations of birds so cockatoos are sexually mature when they're seven and so you can have like grandmother and daughter and granddaughter in the in the same flock um or 50 birds and and that's pretty amazing to learn that you can only learn through genetics because you know Grandma might be 30, she might be 50, you know. I mean, we haven't been doing this study for 30 years, so it's very hard to to be able to understand um, the behaviour of those individuals and, and the longevity of, of their, um, not just their life, but their, their existence in a certain location. So, yeah, there's there's a lot to learn there through the, the genetics. Um, I'll mention, though, it's quite cool with the with the being able to to study the individuals we've got this long-term project where we've got the wing tags on a sample of birds um, of cockies and and turkey brush turkeys and and um white ibis and so that's great getting reports about them um but with the cockies for this particular uh, bin opening study what we did is we would habituate the birds to be fed by us and then we would paint them on their backs with individual color combinations that we could just dab on with some makeup sponges <laughs> so that they could all be quickly recited and and know that you know there's Pete and there's John um and then we could say oh Pete's really good at opening the bin he keeps going and opening the bin um and uh yeah so that was a really quick and non-invasive way to do it um and that you know when the birds molt which they do every year that paint disappears yeah. um, and then getting the genetic sample, as you can imagine, for most studies, you you would either take a blood sample, but birds are quite nice. Um, you can get a feather sample. It's quite yeah. useful. Just scare them, right? And then they just drop them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you might think that, but <laughs> um, we actually, because they were so habituated, you could just pluck the two oh, feathers wow. out. Yeah. And you, didn't get, uh, you didn't get bitten or anything? I feel like I would not do that to a cockatoo. <laughs> You've got to time it right, <laughs> but the best thing is that they often um, turn around and look at the next cockatoo and are like, "What <laughs> did you just do?" And they think it's an aggressive interaction, and so often they'll then turn to the next bird and, and give it a bit of a what for, and uh, yeah. So it's um, but it was really uh, you know a, a really fortunate uh, situation because of the fact that these birds are so uh, adapted to humans. Yeah. And regularly foraging from humans, like going to people's houses or balconies and, and being hand fed. Um, yeah, so there's, there's some really, uh, they lend themselves for this study. It would have been much harder to do this with other birds. Um, Especially wild ones, like, that, like wild, wild ones, right? You don't realize how much <laughs> when you see birds in a city environment, you can get so much closer to them than if you were to look for sulfur crested cockatoos in the forest, right? They would see you from trees away and be like, yeah, I'm out of here, guys. Yep. <laughs> 
Yeah, and so I do research on why ibis in the city, but also out in the western wetlands. And we catch them out in the in the wetlands, but they're nesting at the time. And yeah, and they'll see you from a hundred meters away, and just all fly away. So then you set um, snares on their nests, and then you have to go and hide <laughs> in the vegetation, and you wait for the birds to come back, and then when you're all ready, you go and you you have to then grab those birds and you know you're in waders you're running through the water through the vegetation and anyway yeah it's um it's a lot of fun but uh, uh <laughs> it's it's also a bit of a hit and miss situation because it's it's not a perfect system but yeah those those birds uh you know the exact same species but different individuals we, we don't see the the birds out west coming to the city uh very often they come to the coast but not necessarily to the city and um and yeah they have absolutely no tolerance of people you, you you go into those their habitats and they're just like everyone it's time to go those freaking apes again let's get the <laughs> hell out of here I'm, I'm conscious of your time we're at 30 minutes but have you got time for a few more questions yeah 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 but well i spoke to sean dooley um and i'm the one name dropping now a while back and he told me the story of the white ibis and how they became the the bin chicken you know and correct me if i'm wrong but apparently he was saying they started in hillsville sanctuary in the 1950s at the zoo there where they learnt to eat out of bins and then i think they got moved to i don't know if it was taronga zoo it was a zoo near sydney and then they ended up getting out of that zoo and then that behavior spread did that spread in a similar way um, to the way that it's happening with cockatoos where it was just they saw other individuals doing it and they were like, you know what, this is so much easier, just eat out of the bins, guys. <laughs> um, so Sean knows that story because I told him that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he's a good guy. He's, um, so look, it's, it's, he's spot on there. Uh, the, uh, the chicken and eggs scenario there is really difficult to understand and that's one of the really nice things about this current study is that we could observe it in essentially real time yeah and if we could wind back the clock uh and and observe what happened with the ibis it would be it'd be really fascinating so yeah so hillsville sanctuary um they actually did grab some chicks from the wild uh in the 60s it was and then they they brought them into their uh zoo they were one of the first native species to be independently successfully nesting in a zoo and they were pretty stoked about that and then they just kept breeding and <laughs> it's then... low hanging fruit guys this was easy yeah <laughs> they're ibis <laughs> <laughs> well they didn't know that in the 60s <laughs> and so then they released them into their own zoo grounds thinking that they would leave but they then <laughs> went and ate all the other animals food yeah. why would we go yeah <laughs> and then they easy. had the great idea of shipping them to Corumban sanctuary on the gold coast tipton villa in canberra and Taronga in Sydney. Yeah. And that was in the early 70s. Wow. Okay. And, so uh, it's so crazy to think that was yeah, 50, 60 years ago from now and that behavior is still here. Yeah. Well, it, di it didn't take off that quickly. And so with, with those releases, they were released, uh, I'm pretty sure at all three sites, but definitely at Taronga into the grounds. They yep. were not released into a, an enclosure. They, they were just like, <laughs> hey, they'll just hang around and people will get to see <laughs> them. And this will be great. You know, Huge draw really card. Interesting bird. Yeah. <laughs> Come to the zoo and see the ibis. Um, <laughs> yeah, I take so, it it's, it's not performing that well anymore. I imagine not many people <laughs> are going to Taronga because of the ibis. Look at that. It's it's certainly not something we advertise. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those free benefits that you get when you come to the zoo. You get a really close encounter with the ibis. The unpleasant um, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, and if you're lucky, we've actually, like I've mentioned the wing tags, but we've also got color banded ibis. And so I see the odd color banded ibis that I, I banded back in, say, 2007. Wow. Um, as at least a three year old at that time. They could have been 10 at that time, but all I could age them is they're an adult and three, yep. that's based on their plumage. Um, and that, like that bird was caught in Hyde Park and it's got color bands on. And, you know, here you are sitting there and you go, well, this bird's at least 17 years old. And, it just still goes and eats with the tigers. This, this bird loves to, you know, live life dangerously. <laughs> no, they can't get in with the tigers. They've got fully fenced off. <laughs> but um, I mean, they do eat with the elephants. I, I watch them in there with the elephants. I'm like, why can't I just go walking around with the elephants? That'd be nice. But uh, obviously the birds are pretty quick to get away <laughs> if there was any trouble. Um, but, yeah, so then then they were released in Sydney and, uh, and whatnot. And it... it you know, it wasn't until over a decade later in the 80s that we started to see 
increasing numbers of ibis in the sydney region and that was really slow it's really actually the late 80s and then into the 90s where we're talking about we'd gone from so zero to tens of ibis to across the sydney region having about a thousand ibis in the early 90s and that then changed quite dramatically over the next 20 years and and so now we see sort of seven or eight thousand ibis in the sydney region yeah i know some people listening might be like no, there's way, 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 way more than that. But they're the same actually, ones, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you go and count them, um, which I've spent many a day doing, uh, yeah, there's, you know, we've counted up to 10,000 and that, that varies seasonally as well with breeding. But the, the best place to see ibis is the landfill. And if you go to a <laughs> landfill, you'll see, you can see hundreds to even a couple of thousand ibis. And it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Um, you know that's all our waste that's all food that we've not eaten and put in a bin and it's just a daily buffet that gets refreshed we just need to start eating the ibis and the circle will be complete <laughs> uh, you go first yeah. well that, <laughs> because that they stink yeah, <laughs> they well, that, that do stink. leads on to the point that i was going to make about i think i was reading a paper on the ibis saying that the ones that live in the cities and eat the rubbish end up having a much worse diet obviously and and their health is a lot worse than if you were to find one in, in nature. If that's the case, are you expecting to see the same thing occur with, with cockatoos in the future? If you were to do some analyses on their, you know, the health of either their counterparts in, nat- in you know, the natural environment versus in the city now that they're eating a lot more rubbish out of bins, mm. would you expect to see a, a dive in their health? And if that was the case, what's the benefit to them doing that if they're going to be unhealthy, right? Yeah, and and so just stepping back, I think the study you're referring to was looking at toxins in their eggs and it looked at, is that correct? It was a while ago, so it could be, yeah. Yeah, and so that's environmental toxins that they're ingesting and and they could be ingesting some of those in in urban areas, in creeks and wetlands and, you know, our polluted environment um, as opposed to just from their food. Um, It'd be... um, yeah, I'm pretty sure there isn't a study that's looking at um, the dietary impact on their physical health. It's how it was on the eggs. Okay, but um, I could be wrong. That that happens often. Um, the um, so look with with the ibis and the cockies, look, the the landscape is a buffet. Yeah, and you choose to eat what you want and what's available at the time. Uh, the reality is with bins, those bins go out once a week. And so you've got, you know, Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning to try and get to the bins. Before. Have at it, guys. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, of course, people will, will, if they can, they'll put their bin out late, um, uh, you know, the next morning or, or after sunset. And so and quite often, as, as you experience, the garbage trucks, they arrive pretty early. So there's yeah. there's actually a pretty short window. Yeah. Um, the, the ibis, of course, is quite different because they can be scavenging day in, day out, and I literally could go to a landfill and see them there every day. Um, so you don't think the cockatoos are going to be in a rush to go to the <laughs> landfill, the tip, and then no, displace no. the ibis? <laughs> Look, as I said, they're lazy. They don't want to fly that far. Whereas we saw ibis flying 35 kilometres across Sydney to go to a landfill wow. out in Western Sydney, and they're flying back again. So and that's and that's like point to point. So now that they flew other pot spots as well. So, you know, if you've flown 70 Ks just to go and scavenge some bin food when you could literally not, this was from like Centennial Park in Sydney, people, that's a bird feeding mecca. You could have just sat there and been thrown white bread all day and then go to the, the pond and eat some worms or, you know, catch a fish or whatever. Um, but, you know, there, there are other benefits to to going to the, the disco as the uh, landfill could otherwise be called. Um <laughs> But yeah, so <laughs> you don't want to. Do you want to be more explicit, or you just leave it there and polish over to the next? Oh, <laughs> uh, look, it's um, it, it's an aggregation. If you've got hundreds yeah. of birds, you you get to you know maybe get to catch up with some friends. Um, <laughs> There's a lot a of big... broken beds at the tip. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot of mating going on at the tip. That's for sure. It's uh, <laughs> that happens at the breeding colonies. Um, but yeah, look with the ibis, it's really interesting. Even just observing birds in say Hyde Park in Sydney. Uh, we did a study where we we looked at their, their foraging behaviour on rainy days versus dry days, and you know it's a bit of a no-brainer. On a rainy day, there are no people out, 
because it's raining. And so there, there wasn't the opportunities to scavenge food. What did they do? They ate a ton of worms because when it's wet, the worms come to the surface yeah. and they're more accessible. Dry day, two days later, everyone's back sitting on the grass <laughs> eating some noodles. What do the ibis do? They try to eat noodles. So, you know, they're really adaptable, but what you'd see is even on those days when there's noodles available, they're still eating some worms and they're, they're eating some natural foods. And, and the cockies most definitely are eating a bunch of natural foods and a, a very small proportion of, of bin food. Uh, and, you know, the, the other thing that's readily available for cockies is a lot of people do feed them. Yep. And, you know, the old classic, give them a sayo. Uh, or uh, you know, butter, <laughs> butterscotch or something. You know, what is it? What are those ones? Milk arrowroot. That's the one. Um, and the yeah, ibis so, are just uh, standing there, like, how did you guys? You bastards! Yeah, yeah. Like, I wish we were cute enough and didn't sting it as much as we did to get <laughs> man fed. <laughs> Look, and and so this is goes back to our conversation before about connection to nature and and you know people's appreciation. Look, we're all judgy. People like cockies because they've got character and they interact a bit with you. Look, an ibis has character and they'll interact with you, but people aren't as uh, aren't as appreciative and, and uh, don't reciprocate as much when it comes to that. So, yeah, I, I certainly encourage people to um, increase the love of the Australian flamingo, aka the bin chicken, and um, throw them a sayo. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think they want to say <laughs> they don't have the equipment to chomp it. That's their their challenge. But um, yeah, so yeah, I certainly um, I certainly talk to a lot of people. Uh, people ask me about bird feeding and whatnot, and I guess the simple comment there, since we've talked about it a bit, is birds don't need the food. So if you're feeding birds, you just need to know that that's actually a human thing, and you're doing that for you, yeah. and you should be enjoying. Uh, your moment with those those animals and you should do it in moderation because what we see with particularly say the wing tag cockies is they just fly from house to house to house to house in the morning and in the afternoon <laughs> because they know someone else is going to feed them so they get a feed then that person stops and then they fly to the next house and they get another feed and then that you know everyone goes to work not at the moment in lockdown but um uh people go to work and the cockies go and forage naturally or they go and just chill out and sit in the shade of a tree and then they go, oh, okay, afternoon time, I'll, uh, I'll go get some more food. So what separates the individuals that end up living that life in, in you know, the urban Australia and the same species who just live, say, in the natural environment but on the outskirts, what prevents them from just coming in exactly the same way? Why isn't it just this drain of just animals constantly coming into the cities? The classic sink or source uh, question. Yes. Uh, so one is you you do what you know. You know, yeah. if you if you were born in out near Wagga and you lo love foraging on oak crops and other things like that, you know, you, you don't know that you could fly. Uh, what is it? 500 kilometers and go to Sydney and just be <laughs> and be hand fed, you know, cashews and and peanuts and all this sort of stuff. Oh, you'd um, hate to if you're a cocker too that lives for like a hundred years at times and then only at the end of your life did you discover that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. like you bastards were holding out the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And and so you know, I think that one's a really interesting one with respect to the Ibis because they do fly really long distances and they have this um boom and bust cycle where flooded wetlands out west dry up and so they have to move hundreds of kilometres away. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, um, we don't see them all just going to the city. We do see them move to some coastal areas and so we talk about the coast as being a, a drought refuge. Um, but it's not even just drought. It's, you know, there, there are years that aren't necessarily drought years that there aren't good options out west. Um, so, so yeah, and, and sorry, I, just to digress onto that because we've mentioned Ibis a few times, but it's just, uh, you know, that, that whole thing about uh, going back to that story of, of their introduction to Sydney and the spread of the behaviour, it would have been great to have seen the spread of the behaviour, but the thing that I also find really interesting is how did the word spread? Because you would think that what you've just asked about is birds moving from out west or, or non-urban areas but moving into the city is a fundamental component of the ibis population increasing in the city. Uh, I don't think it was all through breeding, you know. I don't think we went from, you know, 14 birds or 14 pairs of birds being released in 1973 
to having 10,000 birds in 2010, um, you know, that's, that'd be a pretty successful breeding program. Um, but uh, Those tips. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we know that with the juvenile ibis, um, from historic banding data from the 50s, that they had birds move from the western wetlands up to northern, uh, northern Queensland, Northern Territory, even Papua. So that this species occurs outside of oh, Australia. Wow. Um, and we saw that with some band, uh, chicks that we banded in Sydney in 2004 that were subsequently seen up in near Townsville and North Queensland. So they're the, they're the real dispersers. Um, the adults also we've now seen with uh, satellite tracking and GPS tracking of adults out in the western wetlands that we've had birds move, you know, through Victoria into South Australia, Queensland, even up into the NT. And so, you know, they'll, they'll move a couple of thousand kilometres if they want to. That's, that's no big deal for an ibis. Um, and so birds will have gone from the city, potentially the chicks, you know, once they started breeding the city, potentially the chicks then dispersed out of the city, met up with some other ibis and said, you've got to come to the city. You know what's <laughs> there. It's just a it's paradise of bins. Um, and, and, yeah, and when did that bin foraging behaviour start and and you know with the bins for the ibis of course it's open bins they're not opening bins they're, they're just sticking their necks into an open bin and pulling things out um which makes it sound like a pretty easy solution right for sydney if they really wanted <laughs> <laughs> hey look i i don't know if you've seen the uh the olympic mascot for 2032 for brisbane it's the uh, bin chicken so, better be yeah um, and, you know, the rings match the different coloured bins that we've got. So you've got your red and your, your green, yellow and blue. So, yeah. You just need a lobby to make that happen. <laughs> oh, there's there's a movement afoot. Um, I'm, not, I'm not in charge of it. But, you know, if you want to get behind it, then uh, that'd be great. The Patreon uh, link's below, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it's, it, is, it is something that um, we were really lucky with the cockies to be able to see it in real time. And, and with the ibis, you know, these are all adaptive behaviours and they are sort of, so, there's an element of social learning there because, again, um, it's through observation. Yeah. Final question for you, and I'm, I'm aware I've kept you quite a while. Why are parrots, in particular cockatoos, so smart? And, and not only just smart, but seem to have a sense of humour because it, it blows my mind when I see crows, you know, corvids doing these things like solving puzzles and flipping up cane toads to eat underneath because it's not toxic, but they don't, they still seem to be like planks of wood. There's not much going on there, at least in terms of humour, whereas cockatoos, it's like any time you see one, it, you just sit there and watch them and you're bound to shit yourself. Like you're going to laugh at some point. There's going to be something that they do that just makes you just laugh. All right. Well, I think you should see a medical doctor about your um, your laughing problem. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I know exactly what you mean. They look the, the sulphur crested in particular are real characters, but so are lots of the others. The corellas, the galahs, mm -hmm. the black cockatoos don't have as much character, arguably, but they they make up for it a lot in uh, style. Um, so you know, some of the best dressed birds going getting around. Um, look. So play is a really interesting thing that we're doing some research on and we want to do some more work on. And, and this, you know, one of the behaviours that uh, hopefully everyone has seen is, is cockies hanging upside down on power lines and just, you know, throwing their crest up and down and beating their wings and just screaming. And, and then they literally climb back up and then they just will go and swing over again like they're an acrobat and they're just sort of doing little loops and it's, it's a bit like, you know, yourself on a monkey bars or whatever back in the day and, you know, you see all the little kids in the park and you put a put a pole up at, at you know, one metre height, every kid's going to swing on it. And, and uh, how many videos are there on YouTube of the cockatoos with their crests up, like head banging to music, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> And exactly. they seem to know, they, they know they're getting a reaction from you, which is even more uncanny, right? And so I really enjoy that aspect of, of watching them because I see that they're watching us. Yeah. And so they're very observant birds, yeah. So to answer your question, uh, they're long-lived is one of the, the reasons why they, not why they play, but why they're intelligent. You know, when you, not everything that's long-lived is intelligent, but, <laughs> but so that's, that's one attribute of, of more intelligent species is being long-lived. Another is being social. And so if you're spending all day in, in with, you know, a flock of birds and that could be 50 or it could be 100 birds could be more you know you've got to know stuff like 
who's going to beat you up or <laughs> you know who's who's nice or whatnot and so we we, we do some uh, research into social hierarchies and and there is an absolute pecking order and every bird seems to know where they fit in this pecking order and <laughs> you know that takes intelligence to to know whether or not you should be, you know, oh, God, I'm standing too close to Pete. You know, he always craps himself when he laughs. Let's move. Um, <laughs> it so, happens, it happens, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so those two things are, are really important. Um, there are a couple of other key features there with respect to intelligence. But, uh, but yeah, I can't think of them off the top of my head. Right this it's second. just crazy, though, because it seems like it's a bit of a dead end. For intelligence, unfortunately, because they've got no, they don't have any thumbs, right? And so they, they're never going to get, they're never going to create spaceships or, you know, they, they must wake up and just be like, shit, I've got wings, you know, when they get born yeah. and then <laughs> finally work it out. And they're just like, all right, we're just going to headbang. It's, it's just going to be 70 years of headbanging <laughs> and swinging around because that's my only outlet. <laughs> yeah, look, and, and it's a tough one. Um, you know, chimps are, are the, sort of one of the other classics. Uh, they do have thumbs, though. So, um, <laughs> you know. It's I don't know. We'll see. In in uh, in what time frame will, are we going to get chimps building spaceships? It's going to be an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much, John Martin, for being on the podcast. How can people find out more about you're doing it, more about what you're doing? Is there anything you want to plug? Is there any app or um, program that people can get um, involved with to help out? Yeah. So if people are on the socials, uh, we've got the Urban Field Naturalist Project. Uh, we've also got the Big City Birds Project. So you can find those on, um, on Insta and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and I'm also on there a bit with uh, wing tags. And so I, uh, I on Insta and Twitter and, and Waywood Ecology on Facebook. But yeah, there's um, a, a lot of that's just talking about uh, the stuff that we're observing with the research um, and with the Urban Field Naturalist Project, we actually, you know, share your story. So if you write a story, Pete, and uh, it's up to our high, high standards, then um, <laughs> sorry, the, the standards aren't that high and we do uh, provide some editorial assistance. So <laughs> people are encouraged to write their little 200-word stories. Uh, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, if it's something that appeals to you, um, then then that's, that's something we encourage and that's... Um, yeah, it's nice to, to be just getting people to be thinking about biodiversity, uh, so plants and animals in their life and, and um, connecting with it. So whether it's feeding the cockies or whether you're, you're the kind of person who prefers to go and feed the ibis, you know, you, I'm, you, you can be my friend either way. <laughs> awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Good to have a chat. You have a great arbor.